Okay, everyone. Um, I think we'll start. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Shimon Basar. It gives me great pleasure to um, welcome Keller Easterling this, uh, this evening. I'm sure some of you know who um, Keller is, but for those of you who don't, I'll go through the formality of saying a, a few technical things and maybe a few kind of personal things um, as to why I think it's great that Keller's here sharing some of her research. <coughs> Keller's an architect, an urbanist, a writer, and assistant professor of architecture at Yale University. Her projects include the book Organization and Space, Landscaped Highways and Houses in America, a laser disc history of suburbia called Call It Home, and two research installations on the web, Wild Cards, A Game of Augment, and Highline Plotting NYC. I'd like to spend a few moments saying something about Keller's most recent book, which is entitled Enduring Innocence, which in a way foreshadows uh, the things she'll be talking about this evening. Um, from what I gather, there, there's going to be a, a certain amount of time dwelling on, on the content of uh, Enduring Innocence, and then I think Keller will be moving um, into some of the uh, current work. So I, I don't want to give too much away, but I, for me it's, um, I can't sort of go by without saying a, a few words, because I think it's a very important book. Um, and I think it's... Uh, it's a very important book, maybe for the for the f uh, following reasons. So um, I think one of the things that Keller does in Enduring is Innocence is look at what she calls spatial products, which I believe is a term that's once assuredly anodyne, and therefore suitable enough to appear in Donald Trump's boardroom series, um, boardroom TV series, um, The Apprentice. And um, I think it's no uh, kind of accident that these spatial products. Uh, include things like the love boat cruise ship between North and South Korea, the Maharishi's Vedic city in Iowa. And what Keller does in the book, I believe, is sort of um, shows how kind of golf courses become executive toys. And indeed, $20, $20 million um, artificial islands become lifestyle getaways. But for myself, perhaps what's most satisfying about Enduring Innocence is that there is no easy prescription in any of Keller's parables. There are no clear moral waters to wade through in the knowledge that it's only all a Disney ride, that the sharks won't bite, that the pirates are only actors, and that the mermaids will finally triumph. Um, and perhaps the last thing I'd like to say, is maybe it's worth mentioning that the subtitle of uh, that book is Global Architecture and Its Political Masquerades. Um, and prior to entering into the world of architecture, Keller studied acting and theater. Um, and I believe there's an attentiveness to how things and subjects perform that renders um, Keller's writing so acute and indeed so enjoyable. So please well, uh, join me in welcoming Keller Easterling. Thank you, Shimon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. What a nice introduction. Um, I want to see if, rather than give a lecture, I can somehow generate a contemplation about duplicity and stupidity and architecture and some other logics that are important to our being able to be cultural practitioners in a, a world of radically changing global space. Um, so maybe the best place to begin is to talk about a number of stray details that one finds in the world that have political consequence but are not so easily taxonomized by the left or the right. Uh, and I'm drawn to these details, details that seem almost like political phantoms, things that are completely unexplainable. Bush was reelected. Uh, the Midwest fills their gas tanks with ethanol. Saudi Arabia and Dubai, at the epicenter of oil, are working on a Thank you. Saudi Arabia and, oh, let's see. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, there's this images of Dubai, the Dubai metro, but Saudi Arabia and Dubai are both working on some of the most uh, sophisticated automated rail and transport at the epicenter of oil. Walmart, uh, a highly optimized uh, uh, commercial formula, can fall apart 
because of a small artifact about bagging groceries in Germany. It can, uh, an incredibly environmentally abusive organization uh, begins to sell compact fluorescents. And of course, many of these stray details are spatial. Schumann mentioned one, a cruise ship um, uh, called the I Love Cruise ends up uh, penetrating one of the most belligerent uh, and reclusive countries on earth, the DPRK. The whole world stops smoking cigarettes in public places, but guns appear more frequently in places like schools. This a special economic zone, which is the sort of nemesis of NGOs and humanitarian organizations, <coughs> becomes a, a, a free trade zone for NGOs and humanitarian organizations. Mega churches join the Kyoto, join in support of the Kyoto Protocols. Alternative energy is the new boom business to replace dot coms. And while all of these things are not unusual events, they somehow fall between the indices. And maybe the United States uh, perhaps has always been a massive illogical place uh, where one can find ephemeral epidemics of belief from Jesus to the Macarena. They, they go across our country like wildfire. But these, remain, these events somehow remain in some kind of anecdotal ether that's unstructured by a familiar political epistem in which we could store them. Um, and although you may diligently stoke the fires of intelligence and reason, it's this outlying information that somehow catches fire more easily because our predictable logics and all of our measure and reason are left sputtering and helpless to explain it. Uh, we only wait for events to return to conform to our model of the world, and when they occasionally do, we recuperate all of our dominant epistemes and call these strange phantoms, non-conforming information. We expect measure and reason and forthright explanations. We expect people to mean what they say. We expect political leanings to fall somehow in the left or the right and to also suffer through the purification rituals of each of these. We even you know, determine what constitutes a proper political event. Uh, in terms of the sovereignty of nations, for instance, their tools of war, suffrage, citizenship, etc. Um, so political events must be things that happen in official channels, in war zones, and border crossings. Political events are those things that, like war, involve antagonistic logics. Um, even, you know, as the House of Architecture tries to sort of make baby steps into this territory again after its, uh, after its previous episodes of political involvement, one sees it sort of working again just in these heraldic areas that lend a kind of epic total war aura of relevance. But I, I was wondering if we couldn't enter into a contemplation in which it's not the logic of purity uh, and righteousness and reasonableness and binary national antagonisms that prevailed, but to see if there wasn't some logic of duplicity which actually is more informative. I mean, in some ways, how could there be, any, how could there be anything but duplicitousness? I'm, I definitely do not mean what I say. I don't mean exclusively what I say. Um, we were talking earlier this, this afternoon about Irving Goffman and the ways in which he would take so much time to describe how all those layers of speech in addition to what one is actually saying, the text of what one is actually saying, were, would make up layers of meaning or non-meaning or uh, uh, obfuscation of meaning, all the gestures I'm making, all the subtext I really mean, um, all of those things uh, mean that whatever I'm doing is not meaning what I'm saying, but entering into some kind of duplicitousness, even though we feign purity and forthright behavior. So what Goffman called discrepant behavior and what other social scientists have called decoupling, kind of funny hypocrisy, kind of impossibility of meaning what we say. Um, political scientists borrow this term to describe the real workings of sovereignty. In the United States, duplicity is perhaps especially common in light of the fact that um, you know, we, we all have multiple sovereignties, we all have 
divided loyalties. We operate nationally and internationally. We maintain uh, domestic and international sovereignty. Um, this, it's not as if the nation state is somehow dying as transnational movements are, are growing more powerful, but rather that the nation and transnational powers now more vigorously partner. They work together to somehow come up with more advantageous forms of cheating. So uh, that a transnational power may seek out relaxed extra jurisdictional spaces, SEZs and FTZs and offshore locations in which to sort of shelter their money, but at the same time, or shelter their business, but at the same time come back home to sort of massage legislation that will influence NAFTA and GATT. We emphasize patriotism and citizenship while we're, while we're looking for cheap labor and unfilled quotas in the global market. So the stances of any one nation, like any of us who lie to keep ourselves whole every day and spin a little piece of gossip, the stances of any one nation are duplicitous or discrepant reflections of divided loyalties between national and international sovereignties or between the concerns of citizens and shareholders. So the, the position of the left that the nation state is waning and the transnational powers are waxing is nowhere near sneaking up. Um, one needs to juggle multiple sovereignties and mistresses to somehow maintain this perfect camouflage of alternating between believing and cheating. But you'll, but you'll say that the epistemes of nations in war, you might say, the epistemes of nations in war seem to be doing a pretty good job of being able to maintain themselves. They're doing fairly well as dangerous, self-fulfilling prophecies of statecraft. It, it, they seem in some ways to be about nothing but uh, purity and monism. But I would argue that so much of this purity is the duplicitous position par excellence and that it's duplicity that aims to camouflage its own duplicity with purity. And I, have, I have like to call it a sort of special stupidity. Not, not stupidity as we typically think of sort of dim-wittedness, but, a, and here is uh, some of Ronald Reagan's uh, doodles, which uh, would be talking about this, this sort of more simpler condition. But what I'd like to talk about is a, is a sort of compound condition. Special stupidity is not simple ignorance or dim-wittedness. Um, not just the obfuscation of meaning, which we know is a sort of perfect lubricant, maintains a kind of perfectly narcotic world in which everyone can join. Um, you remember what, what Robert Musil said about stupidity, that, uh, that you know, there's no great idea that stupidity could not put to its own uses. It can move in all directions and have all the guises of truth. The truth, by comparison, has only one path and is always at a disadvantage. Um, so, but it's not really this stupidity that I want to talk about. With special stupidity, there's, there's a way of institutionalizing resolute beliefs patriotic, religious, legal, scientific sources around which beliefs will galvanize. And these are coupled with a kind of complex undercover work, CIA, SS, KGB, intelligence operations, so that George Bush continues to stay on message, but an enormous intelligence must continue to track and reset all the naturally errant facts, all those things that contradict his own stupid reality. So there's a remarkable agility deployed in maintaining, uh, deployed in the service of rigidity. Regimes of power at once diversify all of their contacts and sources while they're locking down and tightening their territory, extending and tightening, making their territory stretchier but with boundaries that are more taut. So special stupidity maybe as this sort of duplicity par excellence is a kind of information paradox in which an enormous amount of information is deployed to remain information poor. And somehow here also the violence of remaining intact. This is a common tool of power. You might imagine that's painful as an American uh, if one, as one tries to think of what one can offer to make up for our position in the world. Um, stupidity 
May, uh, contemplation on stupidity may be one of these things we can offer. I mean, let us, let us take care of this. We know it. It's what we have on hand. In fact, it may even be our, our greatest national resource. These strange phantoms of anti-logic, epidemics of belief, these skills with indirect maneuvers. Because we have stupidity and other ultra-duplicities in, in undiluted proportions in America, we can make a giant harvest of them. And maybe there's something um, um, uh, at the very least that demonstrates the ways in which righteousness will always be outmaneuvered by both the agility of, of stupidity, by the agility of both stupidity and uh, duplicity. And there's something about that, uh, since I have nothing else to be proud of as an American, there's something about that that I find strangely inspiring. Um, so while we assume that the grand strategies of, while we assume that there are the sort of grand strategies of Westphalian sovereignty are still uh, in play, it's really another set of logics that are in play, or can we think about that together? Somehow in this discrepant territory, outside the world rehearsed techniques of national sovereignty um, are events that, while not easily explained or predicted, nevertheless do create a shift in sentiment or a cessation of violence or a change in economic fortunes. Um, in America, uh, indeed, many parts of the newly minted world that I will try to show you a little bit later, it's neither reason nor democratic processes, but rather outside deals and ricochets and things that move through populations that are somehow responsible for change. And in fact, take it, taken together, these events probably outweigh most predictable political orthodoxies um, to create a kind of extra statecraft, um, which is the title of this, this talk. And architecture and, and infrastructure are so central to this extra statecraft, I would argue, um, I mean, indeed, uh, space is a crucial indicator or outcropping of most of the uh, violent or politically divisive places in the world. That it's, it's harder for us to maintain our, our, uh, our own special stupidity as a discipline. Um, I mean, we do a pretty good job at it, perennially uh, circling the wagons around a whole a set of, of orthodox uh, techniques. Um, but it becomes harder for us to do that, even to detach something like an autonomy project from what is really our thumping relevance in the world. Sometimes you hear that architecture is not at the table um, when there is with policymakers or elected officials. But, it, it, but if most of the political maneuvering is made by discrepant characters, the shills and service specialists and butlers and quizlings that make most of the decisions in the world, then we're really already at that table as the classic facilitators of power. So here in this contemplation is not a righteous fight or an architecture that goes to war to find violence. These are the impure ethical struggles that are really just another seduction, another ingenuity, another trigger of political consequence, and that are just involved with the politics we already have running through our fingers, uh, and the, that facilitate some of the most common forms of violence. So we, we have many tools of making uh, enclosure, et cetera, but maybe in this contemplation one thinks about a whole, a whole additional set of tools that are in a slightly different register. Uh, uh, in Enduring Innocence, one of the things I wanted to contribute was a discussion of um, spatial products. So I went um, around to look at the sort of air-conditioned Dubais and Jebel Ali's of the architectural soul, uh, looking at free trade zones in Dubai and export processing zones in the South China Sea and automated container ports in Hong Kong and in Rotterdam. Um, the microwave space of satellites in the Middle East, in India and Malaysia, golf courses in China and Kazakhstan, high-tech agriculture in southern Spain, tourism in North Korea, as Shuman mentioned, 
some of the real estate developments of spiritual organizations and, and the global demolition industry. So I, want, I thought that there were at least one technique we could begin to think about uh, to get a handle on the millions of, architect uh, millions of acres of architecture and urbanism and new species of global space that are being made around the earth, around the world, is this idea of a spatial product. And, and when I say spatial product, I'm talking about a, a repeatable formula for space, very familiar. Um, uh, these spatial products are shaped by a parametric manipulation, maybe of tonnage or TEUs or housing frontage or bandwidth or time or stock keeping units or cheap labor. So it's not exactly like the Bilbao's and Guggenheim's of uh, where one is shaping enclosure. Um, since enclosure sometimes is a byproduct of these organizations, the formats are indexical expressions, legal expressions, um, logistical expressions, um, and they create sort of worlds of self-reflexive logic that move around the world like weather fronts. I mean, these are familiar to us in some ways, but we don't really know what it is that makes them. I mean, we sort of lunge at the, at the enclosure to try to do something about it when, when really it's more like the game of golf, a golf that's not only played by men and women in the afternoon, but played by those people who are changing space all over the world in 2,000 acre chunks every day. Um, it's a stretchy format, it's a game you can play in the daytime and the nighttime, you can change the size of it, you can manipulate the frontage, you can add 15% value if Jack Nicholas is involved, you can change the the way that the whole thing works by, like in Cayman golf, by changing something inside the golf ball um, that changes the trajectory of it. So it's finding all these different levers and toggles and remote switches, um, the ways in which these uh, indexical expressions work, that seem somehow crucial. Um, and while these would be things which would make certain people very sad. It feels if architecture lost something. I find these algebraic expressions to be sort of thrilling and um, uh, a place for an enormous amount of ingenuity and uh, relaxation. Um, that these logistical environments are, are not only vessels of some kind of functional organizational parameters, they're also, and this uh, surprised me when I, when I was first working with them because I, I actually thought they were um, m mostly logistical expressions and I should have realized it, but they're also ironically the medium of incredibly puffy fairy tales of, of belief. Um, that, and uh, fairy tales of belief that accompany most uh, sort of steamroller, relentless forms of power. They can be imbued with myths and symbolic capitals. They can become special pawns of political platform. Uh, the, the irrationality of their symbolic capital mixes incredibly easily with the cunning of various uh, political platforms. They are extravagant. They are hyperbolic. They are hilarious. They are costumed. Um, they're filled with psychological weakness and cunning. And they gain entry into almost any situation freighted with all their desires, sporting all their global currencies and duty-free legalities. It's sort of, e they are lubricated by their fiction um, so that they can become um, part of uh, contentious political situations, negotiations between warring countries, messy democracies, violent distended conflict. So all of these hilarious and dangerous masquerades of retail and, and, and business um, have the capacity for a kind of disposition, a very crafty political disposition that's somehow a part of their spatial recipe. Um, and even being able to describe that disposition is something that is under-rehearsed for us. Um, precisely embodying some of the techniques of duplicity and special stupidity, they often use an enormous amount of intelligence to remain information poor. Um, um, 
most of these uh, special spatial products colonize a zone of one sort or another, and, and not or a space of exception or exemption. And when I say exception, I'm not talking about Agamben's notion of exception, but a sort of mongrel commercial form of exception that's much sneakier than a simple, uh, than, a, than a single state emergency. Um, I already mentioned one of the stories from Enduring Innocence, uh, the cruise ship that was able to enter the DPRK, and I'll tell you some more about that. I, I, this, this example is hard not to talk about. It was so fascinating because it was so perfectly duplicitous and so reliant on a spatial product to accomplish its political goals. It was um, part of the, as part of the South Sunshine policy. Uh, Hyundai run, ran a, a cruise ship tour called the I Love Cruise. You know, it had karaoke and the dancing girls, and it was filled with uh, people from the South who hadn't been able to visit. Um, uh, uh, Mount Kumgong, uh, sort of the Mount Fuji of that peninsula, uh, since before the war. So it's just right over the DMZ. Um, they stay in a floating hotel. Um, they arrive in their EM uh, EMS outfits, um, and all along the hiking routes and carved into the mountainsides are the poems of Kim Jong Il. You know, likes Paul Anka, Tom Jerry, Tom and Jerry cartoons. Um, uh, his poems and also the, the sort of uh, uh, aphorisms of Juche is North Korea's philosophy of, of uh, self-reliance. It combines uh, sort of missionary Christianity, uh, uh, Confucian traditions, uh, and the dictates of Stalin in a kind of uh, ecstatic tautological soup. Um, um, and coached the North through its last chapter of grinding poverty. The tourist compound has grown. It now has a Prada and a Gucci store. Um, some of the last people to visit there uh, found polystyrene tigers and bears in the mountains. And when they left, uh, a crew of, of the, the staff there in dancing bear costumes uh, waved to them wh wh while there were sort of these Soviet loudspeakers uh, blasting bye bye love. The story is very strange. Um, and Chang Ji Young, who's head of Hyundai, uh, was going to develop the entire eastern seaboard with sea worlds and theme parks and Hilton hotels and so on, captive, cheap labor. Um, and the cruise ship, uh, 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 which is perfectly a sort of cartoon of the spatial product in that it is something that is a space, it looks for favorable conditions everywhere in the world, a certain uh, color of sand, a certain temperature of water. Um, the developers of the cruise ship know um, how many people will eat veal on Italian, veal parmigiana on Italian night, how many people will be in the, uh, the aerobics class on the floor deck next Wednesday. It's a absolutely airtight logistical formula, um, which was made into a mass market by uh, the Love Boat television series. Before that, it had been an elite, um, uh, an elite tourist pleasure. Um, and strangely, it was, in fact, the, the actual island princess that Hyundai bought uh, to, to run the cruise, the I Love cruise. The other telling detail was that in this uh, sort of game of extortion, Kim Jong-il and his officials uh, requested from Hyundai 30,000 25-inch colored television sets. They would have to be laundered, rebranded, re not they couldn't be Sony's, they had to be uh, branded with Mount Kumgang-san. Um, so in this bizarre handshake between the logistics of shamanism, communism, uh, Confucianism, neo-Christian mythology, uh, Stalinism, Juche, capitalism, this is strange mutual attraction between the DPRK and tourism that says something about the disposition of both worlds. The optimized format of cruising is a kind of solvent fairy tale to the fairy tales of communism and capitalism and the anachronistic cults of modernity. They went for each other <laughs> because they recognized that same um, 
and the importance of a kind of meaninglessness, a kind of vacuity. Um, and, and while uh, the, you know, both have kind of fake crests and epaulets and a kind of gibberish that lubricates the situation. Um, um, and it's precisely, it, it, this is not a crisis of meaninglessness as we might think of in Debordian terms. You know, this, is, this is it, right? Uh, this, this is the ultimate critique of capital. No, it's not that. Instead, it's these absurdist gestures and cultural gibberish and mental vacuity uh, surround a, 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 not a meaninglessness, but a tacit agreement that, that they will mean nothing. Um, so uh, in the same way that these spatial products use fantasies to float all kinds of irreconcilable motives over a revenue stream, and in fact, of course, they're perfect for that. They're perfect for fantasy, the perfect vehicles for it. Um, similarly, in this situation, uh, uh, cruising was the perfect duplicitous vehicle uh, for loading extrinsic information um, into this area. The meaninglessness was the meaning, it was the instrumentality. Um, and it could never have happened if it had come cloaked in official garments or if people were actually meaning what they say. Something much different from kind of third way politics that are being described here, right? Um, um, but it's not simply the manipulation of affect that seems like an important tool to somehow uh, gr learn from in a situation like that, but, but actually the manipulation of uh, a number of other strata of design, the things we do involving measure and organization, and all of our other skills that are, and I think very much in play, but albeit in, in a different register. Another example from the book was um, Elegido, which is a, another sort of sea within a sea, which was uh, describing, um, just like the cruise ship goes and looks for water of a certain temperature and sand of a certain temperature and kind of makes its own world or weather front in the world, this um, Little empire is an empire of photosynthesis. So what you see there is um, uh, the this is like where there's three thousand hours of sunshine every year. So it's just a very graphic example of a kind of world within a world, a sea within a sea, and the the Rome or Alexandria of this world is a is this little place here called Elegido, where there's 200 square miles of greenhouses um, that are growing cherry tomatoes. Um, um, and uh, in these 3,000 hours of sunshine, they have automated systems to deliver nutrients. Every aspect of the little tomato uh, is, is grown in this kind of intensive vegetable urbanism. The laws controlling it sound like the laws for um, uh, controlling New York or London at the turn of the 20th century, except that the citizens of the urbanism are, are vegetables and not the uh, workers who are living in little hutments or charbolas, workers who are from, um, uh, who are illegal North African workers um, uh, from the mirroring shores of Spain that I show you here. Um, Shores that, in this kind of you know symmetrical situation, have have always been in a kind of uh, violent face-off, and it's this uh, outcropping of agricultural tech, high-tech agriculture has only exacerbated those centuries of kind of symmetrical violence or piracy. Um, now, while while labor there is sometimes curated from various other places around the world, like Eastern Europe or South America. Um, you remember that this, in, in 2000, this was a place where violence erupted um, um, over the sort of routinized KKK style raids and, a, and a, a riots and a, and a murder there. Um, but here again is obviously another example of duplicity um, where, I mean, it's easy to say one, uh, you know, has, has a, a national pride, one maintains one's citizenship and looks the other way um, when you need cheap labor. Um, 
It's a stupidity that must keep its contradiction invisible. Um, but there's also something to look at in this cultivation of a building type. Um, it's not the first time that buildings are cultivated, like agriculture. Um, the book that Schumann mentioned before, Organization Space, was trying to look at the ways in which a suburbia was you know, made almost as a kind of sequence of agricultural um, maneuvers. It would be meaningless to go to any one of those volumes and try to fix suburbia by fixing it up or changing. It's not, it's not an issue that has to do with enclosure. It's an issue that has to do, it's a, it's a landscape or a field condition that has to do with populations of things, relationships that we might describe almost with expressions of calculus or expressions like a summation. Um, when we would borrow from anything that's good at from any uh, discipline that's good at, at talking about populations and the way in which they change and the, the relationships that they have um, from networks to, um, to uh, uh, m many other uh, uh, vocabularies. Um, and it, it re to look at this, begin, one might begin to rehearse different species of action where one's thinking more about a change that would enter into a population of things, almost like a germ or uh, like a switch or remote. Not the things that we, can, uh, like architects, can gather onto a piece of paper and control with geometry, but um, another set of maneuvers. So it's, it's interesting as one goes down the road from um, El Ejido to find the sa that same sun being used uh, for the EU's largest solar experiment. America was involved with this before it decided that the oil crisis was over in the 80s. Um, um, and this is not an argument for you know, green technology, but an argument for the way in which a political imagination looks at this landscape and sees many other things that could happen, many other things that could happen with two million tons of plastic, that much sunshine that much water, things that it, uh, it might involve climate, might involve things that are remote to this location and that might be tilted towards different politics. To cheat the system, to cheat the system out of its own abuse, to exploit the exploitation for a little while until the next time. This is a, you know, in Manzanares where uh, the very same technology is being used for, you know, these kind of the utopian ideas of, uh, of wind turbines. So it's a, a slightly different turning of the same situation, which any political imagination would, would be able to take that, that um, landscape and see other meanings within it. Um, of course, we've always been trained in a kind of righteous way, right, to say that what one must do in that situation is provide housing for the worker, stand with a placard and, you know, uh, do the right thing which in that case would be lethal. Um, so, so many of our well-trained techniques are uh, completely inappropriate in, in, within the logics of, of these duplicitous situations. Another site that's in Enduring Innocence, um, and it's going on to, um, to inform um, the next work, which is called Extra Statecraft, is research on, on the zone. Um, the zone is, um, uh, begins with a kind of re repeatable spatial product of the automated port. Um, in 1934, um, you know, we can trace a history of the zone um, from sort of ancient times, from free ports of Genoa or Hamburg to the foreign trade zones that started in the United States in 1934 to uh, the special economic zones in China um, to, to, na to export processing zones that appeared in the 50s and 60s. Um, but now these special zones have grown exponentially in the world. Um, some are a few hectares in size, some grow in conurbations that are hundreds of kilometers in size. And it's now trans been sort of transposed from its early history as a kind of trans legal envelope of transshipment to the perfect legal habitat of the corporation. 
um, a perfect example of this idea of duplicity and stupidity. If it's the corporation's legal duty to abolish uh, any obstacle to profit, the zone is the perfect spatial organ of that. Um, most of these uh, uh, zones are, um, are legal um, envelopes which allow one to avoid taxes, to avoid uh, um, uh, global compacts about labor or environment. And now uh, these kinds of zones are, are breeding more promiscuously uh, with, uh, with other kinds of parks or enclave formats. Because there is almost no program in the world that couldn't find some advantage in, li in sort of existing in this kind of lubricated environment. So now, in addition to sort of the transshipment uh, park or enclave zones, the zone has been breeding with knowledge villages, with IT campuses, um, and even with museums and universities. It is probably, um, a, a good example of a kind of architecture that is behind the screen. In some ways, we have, when we got this object that we have in our hands and in our laps, we became very enamored with the front of the screen because it uh, dramatized all of our beloved geometries. But there, this architecture is somewhat more about the back of the screen, all the nipples and wires that are uh, connecting this thing we have in our lap and our hands to everywhere else where people are fighting and dying and cheating each other and, and making money. Um, so while, while, there's, while it brings forward all those things which we know and which we've learned from the front of the screen, it gives some of that knowledge another sight um, in, in, in all the world that's streaming out from the back. So as I said, as, it, as, this, as this zone breeds with other forms, one of the first forms was a sort of IT campus um, um, that would very easily mix with export processing um, and all those sort of developing countries that wanted to signal that they were entering into the global market by having a place for headquarters and offshore facilities. But more and more programs thrive in a legal lacuna. Why, why wouldn't they? Sort of political quarantine is very good um, um, for, uh, very advantageous for most um, companies. So it's become the new warm pool, the new primordial civilization for the latest cocktail of spatial products. This is Dubai Internet City, which was the first free trade zone and um, IT campus. You know, this is the place where the calling centers and the, um, uh, software development um, is. But it's become um, not only uh, the aggregate unit of, or uh, it's become the aggregate unit of many forms of new global conurbations. Um, not only ports, but these kinds of uh, knowledge villages, et cetera, because it offers a clean slate, one stop entry into the um, economy of a foreign country. And as I said, mo most banish the contingencies of urbanism uh, that would concern labor, human rights, um, um, uh, but they often have a peculiar um, enthusiasm. Um, most zones call themselves a city, for instance. This is you know, Dubai, Internet City, uh, Eben, uh, Cyber City. In Mauritius, there's another high-tech city, uh, high-tech city in Hyderabad. And Dubai has rehearsed a sort of park or city as the only way in which it makes its urbanism. So it, Dubai is made by these kinds of chunks of city. Uh, Dubai Healthcare City, Dubai Maritime City, a Dubai Knowledge Village, Dubai Techno Park, um, Dubai Humanitarian City, Dubai Industrial City, et cetera. Moreover, m more of these um, city-states like Hong Kong and Singapore and Dubai have become kind of global model, uh, the sort of ethos of the free zone to make a kind of world city that's different from a, from a 
from a national capital, but can even be the doppelganger of a national capital. Shenzhen and, and Pudong, obvious examples of that. Uh, another sort of a paradigm. So here in New Songdo City, uh, which is uh, a massive city made by KPF, it has a central park, it has um, a, a, a canal street, a park avenue, it has a World Trade Center. Um, it has um, kind of bonanza music and so on to uh, announce it, is another one of these, uh, it's essentially a doppelganger of Seoul, but it's no longer just a kind of transshipment envelope at the edge of the world. It's a free, it's a, 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 a whole city with a full complement of programs. Um, the zone also considers itself heir to the same privilege and liquidity that petrodollars enjoy. So just as the, just as the most of those funds remain the kind of invisible offshore location, um, this kind of city also needs to get away and relax. So it's often associated with uh, vacation um, uh, imagery. Um, again, operating a kind of frictionless realm of exception. This is a uh, King Abdullah economic city, another entire city as zone. This is Kish uh, in the, off the coast of uh, Iran, Kish Island, where one can um, uh, vacation and uh, um, uh, be in a zone that is merged with a resort or a theme park. Theories of, of, of total war would speculate that infrastructures and techno technological developments, even most forms of urbanism, are first military apparatus. But it, it's not always nations and wars, but often massively capitalized corporate conglomerates um, that create global alliances and transnational infrastructures that avoid war um, because it's bad for business. So foreign direct investment is funneled um, not only uh, through national treasuries, but through these um, kinds of massive conglomerates. So part of some of the next work that I'm doing is just, just simply trying to follow some of these parastate uh, quasi-diplomatic consortia, uh, whether they're made by Mitsubishi, Kawasaki, Siemens, Weed, Bin Laden, um, that deliver technologies like the high-speed rail that I showed you earlier, or um, export processing zones, or like PSA or P&O, um, manage um, global ports all around the world, almost like a kind of contemporary counterpart of the British or Dutch East India Company. Um, the technology parks that, that I was showing before have their own satellite links, their own cable networks, um, uh, their own headquarters within those networks that operate like embassies, um, uh, their own real estate developers to develop a familiar architecture within the network. One also finds, you know, one of the stray details that I showed you at the beginning of this talk was the way in which as they breed with very different kinds of programs, one also finds them coming out as the, the opposite of what they originally thought of here is a free trade zone as a humanitarian city housing the NGOs and humanitarian organizations. Um, one finds zones for universities and museums like Qatar, Education City, or Sayat Island in Dubai. This is Dubai Humanitarian City. So as the gulf widens between the extremes of, of Dubai development and the slums of Lagos or Kinshasa, um, this corporate city um, uh, also, I hope I'm driving home the point about duplicity there, um, uh, Dubai is sort of the perfect example of a kind of uh, collapse between those ancient forms of of entrepot and the contemporary forms of zone. Um, it is a kind of archipelago of archipelagos, um, 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 a special kind of mongrel exception in a kingdom um, uh, and, and something which, which I'm using now to sort of study this world of extra state craft, this network of, of, 
other consortia. But the, this kind of zone also uh, uh, enjoys its own um, uh, extra state violence, perhaps, um, but a violence that always avoids war. It doesn't really involve the sort of mega slums, but of, of Lagos or Kinshasa. It's not involved with the chaos of informal companies. One looks at the offshore, offshore sweatshops in Saipan or the maquilladoras on the thickened border of the United States and, and Mexico. There's a form of labor exploitation there that's, that's uh, stabilized um, within the law. Um, or if one looks here at Khartoum, um, this is a development at the um, joint of the White and Blue Nile. Um, there uh, is a this is a development by Dubai developers, um, which will, sh you know, exacerbate the, so much of the the violence or uh, uh, antagonism between the north and the south in the Sudan. So many of these new legal hybrids that are oscillating between visibility and invisibility, some kind of identity, some kind of special uh, 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 symbolic capital for their nation, or, uh, 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 or a kind of anonymity uh, uh, hiding. Um, so many of them have not been either analyzed for their disposition, for their patency, their exclusivity, their aggression or resilience or violence. Um, so because these episodes Explore, explore the duplicitous territory between sovereignties. Maybe they suggest their own tools of political manipulation, and they're tools that probably evaporate in environments of righteous political stances. Um, so outside the purity of cultural scripts that we might regard to be politically authentic are a number of rapidly mutating political scripts that, 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 may, that may require some immediate tools in the world's urgent situation, despite their lack of political pedigree or their reference to political theology. Um, most urgent then for architecture might be, you know, not a, not a righteous consolidation of our singular position, but a proliferation of tools that we might use um, that are in slightly different registers with slightly different hands or instruments than the ones to which we're accustomed. Um, so this research is uh, designed to find some levers or triggers of political consequence that expand outside those customary scripts for activism. Um, and the hope is that these tools in some impure ethical struggles um, might better contribute to the temporary diversion of some of the world's most grisly abuses and cunning stupidities. Um, but it is tools for those who are too smart to be right. Those were my remarks. Thank you. Okay, um, I think Keller will take a few questions, and while I uh, urge you to prime them on the tips of your tongue, perhaps I could ask you the first question, Keller, which is <coughs> a word you used early on, which um, is that a fiction? And I'm thinking of a kind of double fiction, and I wonder if they actually do relate. The first fiction is I'm wondering how you, one of the ways in which I think maybe you get from architecture to politics is also through something like fiction. And it makes me think that in, its, in both of their essences, maybe both architecture and politics are essentially fictions. And then the second fiction is that of um, the fiction that um, architects that we valorize in a place like this, or at your faculty, um, fiction are, their, the, their great duplicitous fiction is that their architecture actually really Sub is substantially present in the world, whereas in fact we know it's a, it's a minuscule percentage, if, if that. And the stuff that you're really dealing with reminds us actually that of how um, incredibly selective the architecture, of particularly the sort of pedigree level of architecture and particularly the star architecture world is. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, that's also a kind of fiction 
So I'm wondering if you could maybe elucidate on this, on the use value for you of this notion of fiction, perhaps. Yes, well, um, the, the, these, these organizations are, are completely reliant on, on uh, fabulous stories. Um, and, uh, um, and duplicitous motives. They would not work, they would not be able to enter where they enter, they wouldn't be able to, they are lubricated by their fictions. Um, um, and I said earlier that I think we, we also have, they, our, our sort of special stupidity is our, our strange, um, our strange, uh, protection of our own craft. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, um, we, were had, we had a seminar earlier today where just to have something to, that would be fun to talk about, we talked about two questions that I always am asked, which is what, how does this have anything to do with architecture is one question, um, <laughs> which is almost unbelievable, but it's a it's very, very seriously posed question. Um, and another, you know, is w w w what does this have to do with politics? Mm -hmm. Also, a very seriously posed question, mm -hmm. which is sometimes hard for me to understand. But uh, but it it is, you know, for architecture culture, um, a, a, an, a totally different set of tools and documents, um, which which would be required to actually. Um, take on the logics of these spaces. So when um, Zaha and Gary have been making a space for Sadiat Island, which is another zone, it just has museums mm. and uh, it'll have Yale in it too, and um, uh, the Louvre and so on in the zone, um, there's really no strata of uh, our discourse which would allow them to work on anything mm. else but to provide that kind of um, signature. And it's not at all insignificant. Um, what I was just hoping is that, would one have one moment at least mm. of, uh, in our training where we would work on some of those other algebraic expressions or some of those, a substrate of other logics. Are there any questions or even any comments? Irit, yes. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to articulate this, but um, what, what you've put forward some, some somehow calls forth for me a set of speculations about the simple. Um, and <coughs> I, I would locate that some, somewhere between Forrest Gump as one model of the simple, um, the kind of notion of the simple that um, Umberto Eco brings up in the name of the rose as the you know, rose that have faith outside of the kind of Byzantine complexities of the church's power politics. And um, it was something that Bill Redding said to me a long time ago when we were suddenly all getting very good jobs in the United States, and <coughs> I, I, we were speculating about why so many foreigners were getting good jobs in the United States. And he said, um, it's, it's very important to keep criticism foreign so that reading can remain native. And that's something that, that, that sort of, and that, and that connects with the constitution of the simple, or the maintenance of the simple. And I'm sort of wondering whether extra statecraft, which has very sophisticated structure as you've presented it, it's complex and it's duplicitous and it mimics and mirrors and, and, and also requires or depends on the constitution of the simple um, as its kind of corollary in a way. Um, the, the sort of the way in which when you look through magazines, um, there's you know advertisements for kind of housing projects that <coughs> have no integrity at any level, no relation to a locale, no, 
no, no relation to anything that I can recognize as an index of relationality. And then I'm wondering from where do you read these outbursts? From what, what state of demand? From and, and I keep going back to this notion of the simple. I'm not entirely sure what I mean by it, but um, th they're, they're necessary for each other. It's not written for stupidity. It's, I think that's very steady. I mean, Mineral's raving is more like your idea of it as a simple, um, which is which is not the kind of compound conditioning such as stupidity that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little bit simpler notion of such as stupidity because for him, and it's perplexing in the book, but because for him it really was crucial that he remain simple. You know, like this David Bergen tells a story of like when when the night before the G8 summit, he, he, he was worried because uh, they didn't seem to, to have stayed up all night and they were worried because they gave him this big briefing book to look at and that he had actually looked at the briefing book and they were worried that Nancy Reagan would get mad at him and that all things would fall apart. And he sat down at breakfast and, and said, um, uh, fellas, I, it looks like I did a great job in the briefing book, but I, I didn't get a chance to read it. The Sound of Music was on last night and I, I just love that. And, I, and David Bergen said, you know, he was never better uh, because he absolutely had the big picture. It was uncomplicated by any kind of stray information, any intelligence. Um, uh, Kissinger also said that about Reagan, that somehow he, this one actually introduced facts into his regime that it, everything fell apart. Um, but I would still argue that both some kind of compound condition. I don't think it is just simplicity. I think it is duplicity. Because there is, uh, and I think one, one has to be agile enough politically to outwit that. Because it is absolutely cunning. Um, it's not just Reagan, but it's Reagan in with someone else. Um, and it's, uh, the, uh, it's a kind of uh, way in which um, information can be Banished from a sort of pure regime. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm sure. I, I think you're absolutely right. That uh, wasn't the direct. But that those are the actors, yeah. and I'm talking about the audiences, the the readers of the brochures, the visitors to the shopping malls, the buyers of houses in in golf clubs, um, the 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 kind of. of that audience get constituted because expert stagecraft needs an audience it needs a public it needs participants well i guess all of, all of these regimes are attractive because they only reinforce and then kill it too uh, like one um, um kind of solipsistic environment mundane domain um so any of the people whether they're uh, people who live in residences or whether they're corporations that have their headquarters there, it's a, it's a domain of absolute compatibility um, that has a lot of information in it. Um, it's incredibly sophisticated technology, uh, et cetera, but, but has uh, nothing but compatible information. And that is absolutely what is advertised, that, that what you will have here is is a one-stop shop, is a clean slate, um, a place where there will be no bureaucratic uh, complications. Uh, that, is, that You're describing the advertisement um, in, in a way. Um, but did that become nice for a while? Uh, <laughs> but in a way, Iri, I think, because often I think where you, where you find these adverts is very telling. You know? And so they're in the property pages in the FT, no? and they're in the How to Spend It magazine and so on and so forth. And it's absolutely a, B, class A, B. No? And so there's, again, it's a comp, the, the degree to which um, 
the, the, the so-called simplicity of the image demands a kind of a prior sophisticated audience is also kind of... It's also, there's, there's in a way, there's a huge investment in forgetting. So I, I think part of what I'm talking about in Constitution of the Simple is um, it's not halfway to a mess. It's a kind of because the, the sort of corporations of and their paraphernalia, so the, the, the headquarters and then the residences for the, you know, the, the, the people from the corporation, that's, that's power and control. That's the ability to, to take over a space, somebody else's space, control it through capital and, and so on. But that's something different. And there's, there's a kind of gullibility uh, of those who are simple by processes of forgetting the woes and of woes. Mm -hmm. So you can, you know, march into some golf club, you know, <laughs> retirement <laughs> community, settlement, come shopping mall, and forget. But I, I hasten to say that, you know, if, I, if we, we were looking at the, the new song goes to the video with its <coughs> Segura Ross music and its sort of like uh, uh, bird's eye sweep over the fake Canal Street and the fake World Trade Center and the running across the bottom and saying it feels like home and so on. I'm not looking at that in some kind of ironic, like mm. some kind of ironic pleasure or some kind of tragic view of this world. For me, the, it's comedy makes it tangible. It makes this world another seduction for our own ingenuity. None of what I'm trying to talk about here is in any way a kind of tragedy. It is so psychologically weak, so hilarious, so absolutely penetrable that for, for a, from a number of different um, points of affect and uh, desire, um, but one has to learn to manipulate that, which is not so hard for us with God, you know. Um, you know we're correlative thinkers. We, we really have all of this in our hands, you know. Um, but we're t we sort of stay in a very shallow pool, you know, uh, to use it. You know. But maybe I could just uh, ask you a follow-up question to that, which is often the most high-profile um, kind of critics or commentators on particularly, let's say, the Middle East or even China, you know, they're, they're first, they have to make it extremely clear, um, they have to remind us immediately from line one how morally abject these environments are. And it's in reading your book that one of the things you don't do is make a kind of moral judgment, it seems to me. I mean, um, how difficult is that or is, how conscious do you make that, the, the sort of suspension of a kind of, of, uh, of, of a moral evaluation of the situation? And, and how, how do you feel? I mean, for those of you who don't, obviously someone like Mike Davis, for me, is yeah. the complete opposite, no? who is just there to wave the big, his big finger uh, over the whole situation, and then there's a whole kind of slew of people who follow after that. And, um, but it seems to me that one has to sort of not do that in order to pe perhaps, as you say, penetrate into what else is happening there. But maybe you could say something. Yeah, it's, it's, fun, it's funny, there are times when this, when this material is presented that seems absolutely to do with only caprice and with s the strange hyperbolic stories of the world and then times when somehow, whatever, for whatever reason, it seems somehow more responsible for something. Um, um, but it, it, there, it's, if, if, like for instance, when I show the sort of the way in which the zone outbred itself and became its opposite. Um, there, there, is, there is no sort of prescriptive format, obviously. There's only some kind of um, temporary ingenuity um, uh, with these situations. Um, I mean, obviously, one also goes home and votes. <laughs> and, um, there is a politics where you stand up and call it a name. But when, when there are changes of this magnitude going on in the world, it's, it's, it's an irresistible seduction to begin to think about being able to tilt them slightly you know, towards different politics. But that would not work in uh, an environment of righteousness. Righteous tools won't do it. It just won't work. Um, you would be powerless in that um, situation. Um, it's, 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 it's own logic. That changes. 
not politics from within, for a different, from like Eduardo. Eduardo, yeah. Um, going back to, to the issue of, of um, Morai, I mean, don't forget that the communication is, is uh, quite careful to to step out of the of the moral, <coughs> or, or at least of defining which is right, what is right and what is wrong. But uh, somehow already in the fact of choosing the word uh, stupid to define one of the strategies which, uh, which operates in, uh, in, in, in this special, in special stupidity. But already the, the, the fact that in, in the term special stupidity is the word stupid, uh, I don't know if that is already prompting most of the argument into morale, no? Mm -hmm. Because stupid is already, I mean, language, I mean, that, that word already has a morale. But I don't know if, if the discourse can escape it later, even though you, I mean, you're constantly sort of using a quite sophisticated way of, of, of stepping back from that morale, which is already there once you have chosen that word. I don't know if it, uh, I mean, what's, what's your position on, on the issue of morale? On not only the issue of morale, but why did you choose the word stupidity to present well, that view? Well, because I'm an American, and because of, you know, <laughs> 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 if, I, if, I live, if I lived by the sea, I would bring, I would come and bring in, you know, a bushel of fish. But I'm from America, so what do I have to bring you? The, this is what I have on hand, and um, you know, this is Academics are believed these things which which reasonable people don't understand. But yet, is there something there? If they're so powerful, is there something there? And so, and is there something which er has eluded our reasonable logics? And so that that's just a, it's just a place to be. You know, um, it's not a judgment. It's like because it's both cunning and admirable and terrifying. You know, to use that. I like this idea that as. Everything becomes outsourced from America. The one homegrown produce is stupidity. Yeah, right, <laughs> Organically right. farmed stupidity. There was a question at the back, please. Oh, sorry, Marina's got the mic. Go for it. No, why don't you? You've got the mic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you have the mic. The mic always wins. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the talk because it clarified many of the things we discussed in the morning. Oh, and really? uh, oh good. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have a <laughs> I don't know if it's a question or just a kind of a thought. Um, I think, and also it made clear for me the line you tried to <coughs> draw between the state of exception, at least in, in the way that Agaben tries to define it, and the state of exception. I don't know if I... <laughs> um, but in the state of exception, by a, in Agaben's term, um, modernity is kind of located at the point where the individual meets the species or the population. And it seems that in your case, um, the discussion remains on the level of, pop of the population. And I wanted to ask whether that kind of point, uh, intersection, you know, can exist in that state of exception you are trying to <laughs> propose as kind of alternative to I don't know. I, mean, there I, said it's, I don't know if it's a question or just a kind of trying to think yeah. through these kind of terms. You know. mm. If one doesn't know, then uh, I mean, in part, this puts aside or uh, it, it doesn't try to dispose of, but just simply puts aside the, the questions of citizen demos uh, of of the sort of meeting of the individual. Um, uh, uh, with some moment of reckoning in culture, just just temporarily, just to look at something else, um, and here to look at some mongrel commercial form of, of exception, which is more treacherous than, for me, mm. to me, more treacherous than the state of exception that Gomben describes um, it, within a legal parameter, because here legalities are swapped and traded and camouflaged um, in a way that it makes it almost impossible to find some line at all with which one would have a reckoning. Um, there's certainly not citizens there, 
um, you know, there's, there's, it, it, there are, are moving populations, um, which, you know, when we think of what, what Balabar has said about, is there then some intermediate instrument that, that begins to operate that is, that is, that has nothing to do with our well-rehearsed patterns of statecraft, citizenship, suffrage, mm -hmm. so on, which we, which we deign to offer as a universal right, you know, that, uh, you know may, maybe there's something else much more sophisticated um, to deal with some of these um, complex situations, rather than the sort of, some of the blunt tools that we typically have. Can you shout? And I wonder whether the architectural firm, the architectural office is the right kind of vehicle that even if you were to find a proliferation of, you know, it, it, find a kind of a new palette of tools, how effective that could be in the face of what seems to be kind of an irresistible kind of logic. Well, what, I, I don't, in some ways, um, you know, it's these all kinds of populations of things, it, when there are these large volumes <coughs> of buildings and so on to buy, talking this morning, it's like, it's, uh, how, how much curtain wall is going up into the corner? You know, um, so, I mean, there are different ways of parsing a project. Uh, uh, KPF is parsing it as a one-off world city. Um, uh, m many architecture firms uh, that we know about that have been cradled in the incubator of digital formalism, which we all have learned so much from, now each of those have a, t a tower on Sheikh Zayed Roof. Now it's like the tower, you know, Jesse has one and uh, Ali has one, and you know, they all, and they're, you know, they're, you know, absolutely just the right manifestation of the work that they've been doing in some ways. But if one parses it slightly differently to see details, to populations, things which are made um, not as enclosures, but as I mean, Ali talks about w wishing there was some way to produce in volume another species of curtain wall. You know. So now this is a, sounds like a sort of stupid example, but but I'm just trying to say that even even like straight down the line, architecture work could be manipulating um, the way that things are built and constructed through, through a completely different tool, but but one that involves also the art of law. But just slightly differently or in another way, for instance. Does that make hmm. sense? Yeah. Of course. Yes. Maybe one, there's one more question or comment. Matthew. failure because I think that my own stupid definition of stupidity would include some moment of failure. For instance, if my dog couldn't open a door or whatever. So I was wondering if there are similar moments that I might have missed or, 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 or are they not um, evident, these kind of points of failure that led you to define something as stupid. that they're incredibly volatile, incredibly vulnerable, even those things that feel most massive and impending. Um, does that give you an answer? Mm, you want well, an example? You, you want an example? Yes. Well, it's so <laughs> scary, so <laughs> it's so scary, 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 uh, has this special stupidity, and is is that 
is that um, characterized by their failure to execute what they wanted to execute? As in, if I spoke about my dog's failure to execute his ambition to open a door, and his failure to learn how to open that door, then I would define him as being stupid. Okay, it's eight o'clock. I recently wrote at the end of my review of Keller's book that I think she should set up Keller Easterling Travel Agency and she should do package tours. And it would be an alternative around the world trip. And I think it would be really amazing. And, um, and it was an amazing talk. So thank you, Keller, for showing us your version of the world.